name is Michael A. Ventrella. I'm going to read to you today from my latest novel called Big Stick, a steampunk alternate history story with Teddy Roosevelt and Mark Twain and a bunch of other famous people, but I'm not gonna spoil that for you. It's published by Eric Flint's Ring of Fire Press. You can see the cover behind me, except you can't see the main character. The main character there is that woman. Her name is Beverly, and of course she's with Teddy Roosevelt. Basically, just to give you an idea, because we're gonna pick this up in the middle a little bit, is that she belongs to what she says is a secret organization. Teddy's not sure if he believes her or not. He is the commissioner of police. This takes place in 1898 in New York City. Um, he is the commissioner of police in New York City. She tries to get him to help. He doesn't want to. She, more things happen. And at one point, she sneaks into the house of the bad guys because she wants to hear what they're doing. And she tells Teddy to stay away. So she's in the bad guy. This story takes, this scene takes place where she's with the bad guys. Um, She's up on a balcony looking down into like a big sitting area where some of the most powerful people in America are sitting and planning some great conspiracy and she's trying to learn it while being very quiet. Um, so we're gonna pick it up from there. It's kind of in the middle. I will give you a warning, however. Uh, these bad guys are terrible racist and they say awful bad things because they're the bad guys. So please excuse the language sometimes. Do you like that? Locke said, it's good to have friends in the press. Even if he does reappear, his reputation will be ruined. No one will pay attention to Teddy Roosevelt ever again. For Roosevelt, that's a punishment worse than death, Phineas laughed. Yes, I dare say you won't have to worry about little Teddy anymore, Locke said. He took a sip of brandy and then held it before him, his index finger extended towards Phineas. So, on to the Hobart project. Tell me about these new devices. Metal eaters, I may men call them, Phineas said. Picks up metal, spits them back out as bullets. Pure chaos! Even a few of these devices will distract everyone. You'll be quite impressed. Very good, Locke said. You want to have them to demonstrate at the ceremony, I take it. You'll have enough in time? Not as many as I'd like, but enough, yes. Have you told anyone else about this? Asked Melville. My employees obviously know about these things, if that's what you mean, Phineas said, but they don't know what I want them for. Good, Melville said. And you can get them here in time? Oh, of course. Barring some unforeseen yelling came from behind the closed conservatory door, followed by crashing noises. The men jumped from their seats. Locke reached into his side and pulled out a small pistol as the door burst in. I'm sorry, sir. I tried to stop them, said Morris. Nobody stops me. Teddy jumped into the room with a broad smile. He placed his hands on his hips, as if posing for an advertisement for rugged menswear. I understand there is an important meeting here that I was mistakenly not invited to. Beverly would have slapped herself across her face, but she knew it would attract attention. Commissioner Roosevelt, Locke appeared joyous at Teddy's appearance. What a surprise. We were just talking about you. He placed his pistol onto a side table. What esteemed guest you have, Mr. Locke, Teddy replied. He reached out and shook Locke's hand and then turned to his guest. Professor Phineas Grimsby, how are things out in Brooklyn? And Chief Justice Melville Fuller. This is indeed an honor. What brings you here so far from Washington? Neither man responded, and both refused Teddy's hand. They kept throwing nervous glances back at Locke. Locke, for his part, continued to smile and motioned for Teddy to take a seat. Teddy obliged and then turned to Morris. I will have a brandy as well, if you please, good man. Morris glanced at Locke, who nodded his approval, and then sat as well. The other two men took their places but eyed Roosevelt warily. Locke waited until Teddy was provided with a drink and then held his up in salute. When Teddy reciprocated, they all took sips. Forgive me for saying this, Mr. Roosevelt, Locke said, but you look to be in excellent health for a dead man. Ah, the Daily News, Roosevelt scoffed. I'm surprised I can even spell my name right, much less get their facts straight. Nope, the paper is once again wrong. I am not dead. Healthier than ever. He patted his chest with one hand to make his point. Beverly slowly reached into her bag, her eyes on the scene below. So, so what brings you here, Commissioner? Teddy leaned forward in his seat. I heard you were having a meeting of prominent people, and it appears I was informed correctly. I came hoping you could help me. I'm investigating the recent rash of lightning attacks on places in the city. He pointedly looked at Grimsby. Surely you've heard of them. Grimsby looked as if he had just swallowed something foul. 
And what, Locke said, makes you think we may know something of these things? Teddy shrugged. You must be aware that these attacks occur soon after Anthony Comstock preaches against the very places that are hit. Locke linked his fingers together before him. That's certainly been the presentation in the newspapers, but that has nothing to do with us. Teddy raised his eyebrows. Really? Nothing. Fuller snorted. What are you implying, man? You come in here uninvited and then accuse our host of lying when he tells you the truth. We have nothing to do with this Comstock fellow. Teddy leaned back. Ah, my mistake then. It must have been his identical twin I saw leaving this house just 10 minutes ago. There was a short silence. Beverly stopped digging around in her bag for fear she would make too much noise. Well, Mr. Commissioner, Locke finally said, if there is nothing else we can do for you, I am also looking for the man, or men, who tried to kill me and the woman investigator who was with me. Fuller snorted again. Investigator? Is that what they're calling them these days? Teddy did not move, but shifted his eyes to stare at Fuller. I certainly do not think you meant to demean a good woman's reputation, sir. Beverly's hand stirred through her bag. Where was it? Fuller lifted his chin. Mr. Commissioner, who you decide to spend your time with while your wife is away is of no concern of mine. Teddy stared for a few minutes and then leaned back and laughed. Everything they're saying about you is absolutely true, isn't it? He pointed a finger at Fuller. Can't imagine there can be a talented, skilled Negro woman, can you? I could tell when I read Plessy. Where did you get that idea, Dred Scott? Beverly wasn't sure what all that meant, but clearly Fuller did, as he rose from his chair, fist clenched. You pompous little cop, he said, pointing a finger at Teddy. Do you know who I am? Teddy smiled up at him. The jerk who set our country back 50 years. Gentlemen, please, Locke spoke, but Fuller ignored him and leapt from his seat. Many things happened at once. Fuller reached past Locke and grabbed the pistol from the table. Teddy jumped from his seat, reached into his pocket, and pulled out a small device. Grimsby rose quickly, knocking his chair backwards, and reached into his jacket pocket, but got tangled. Beverly grabbed the handle of the immobilizer that Ace had given her and swung it around to point through the banister down into the room. Morris dashed out of the door into the hallway. Locke reared back, his brandy crashing to the floor, and began yelling, For God's sake, stop this. We're all gentlemen here. Fuller pointed his pistol straight at Teddy's chest. All but one, he said. You said you were going to make sure he was dead, Preston. Teddy pointed the device at Fuller. That's what I thought. Thank you for your confession. You are all under arrest. Locke laughed. Arrest? You're going to arrest me and the Chief Justice of the Supreme Court? Grimsby finally freed himself from his entanglement and pulled out a copper-coated gun that had a wide cone at the end. Beverly squinted at it. She had never seen such a weapon before. By the power vested in me by the state of New York, Teddy began. Are you completely mad? Locke said. We have a pistol and a... Whatever that thing Phineas has? Both pointed at you, and you're holding a... What is that? This? Teddy nodded his head towards his weapon. This is the most advanced weapon possible, suppressing all science you have seen before. You do not want to be on the receiving end of this, I assure you. Beverly suddenly recognized Teddy's device. She growled and aimed the immobilizer at the back of Fuller's head. I advise you to drop your weapon or I will shoot, Teddy said in a tremendously serious voice. If you know anything about me, you know that I never bluff. I will do no such thing, Fuller replied. I'll complete the task that should have been done yesterday. Teddy squeezed the trigger. A small shot of a pinkish liquid spurted from the end of the gun and landed on Fuller's shoe. For a second, no one moved. Then Fuller raised his pistol. Teddy threw his weapon at Fuller's head and dove to the floor. Fuller jumped aside, but the metal object grazed his temple. He cursed in a most ungentlemanly manner. He shot, and the bullet blasted through the back of a chair. Watch it, man! Locke screamed as he ran to the fireplace. Those are antiques! Teddy rolled over and flipped himself onto his knees. He grabbed the nearest chair and gave it a push. It hit Fuller in the knee, and the justice hopped backwards shooting another bullet into the grandfather clock. Springs flew out of it and into the room and bounced off the carpet. Beverly tried to aim at Fuller. She needed him to be still for at least a few seconds to have the slightest chance of hitting him. Fuller refused to cooperate. Locke reached up and pulled the velvet rope hanging from the ceiling. Morris! Damn it, where is that lazy son of a bitch? 
Grimsby took a step towards Teddy, pointed his weapon, held it before him for a second, and then twisted it back and stared at it angrily. Teddy ignored Grimsby. He bounded forward from behind a chair, then took the stance of a trained pugilist. <laughs> Put away that gun and fight me like a man, he said to Fuller. Fuller responded by lifting the pistol. Beverly saw her chance. Get him, Mr. Gooey, she whispered. A pellet flew from the end of the gun and hit Fuller in the arm. What the? The goo quickly expanded up a Fuller's arm, and within seconds, it had covered the right side of his body, from his arm down to his foot, with the gun safely encased. Beverly took a deep breath. With a pistol out of the way, Teddy showed his chance. Grimsby, meanwhile, had pulled out a screwdriver and was crouched in a corner, doing something to his cone-headed gun. Up there, Locke said. It's her! He took a step to a side table, opened the top drawer, pulled out a second pistol, and pointed it at her. Beverly dove back to the floor and slid her way back to get as close to the wall as possible. The splintering of wood near her head made her heart pound so close. She heard Teddy bellow a war cry and she ventured a peek. Locke was picking himself off the floor, the pistol having been knocked out of his hands. Teddy stood over him in a fighting stance, his fists before him. First place boxing champion at Harvard, class of 80. Locke paused for a second and then matched Teddy's stance. I must warn you, sir, I am in very good shape for my age. Physically, perhaps, Teddy taunted, but morally, you have quite a way to go. Forget him. Get me out of this, Fuller lowed. I can't move. His left arm scratched against the goo, which had hardened into a resilient solid. Resistant solid, sorry. Locke took a swing. Teddy blocked it with his left forearm and gave Locke a quick poke in the chest, just to show he could. Locke stumbled backwards a few steps. Beverly turned her attention to Grimsby, aiming the immobilizer at his head. Got it. Grimsby exclaimed. He dropped the screwdriver and spun around to point his whatever it was at Beverly. She squeezed her trigger the same time as Grimsby. A shot of goo hurled across the room to splat into the wall behind Grimsby's left shoulder. He ignored it, shook his weapons a few times, cursed, and then ducked down to the floor and felt around for a screwdriver keeping his eyes on Beverly. Beverly knew she would need to get closer in order to make the shot, so she hitched up her skirt and ran down the stairs. The noise of battle surrounded her, mixed with Fuller's curses. A lamp flew before her and smashed against the banister. Unfair, she heard Teddy shout. Stop kicking my gun away, Locke responded. She had gone halfway down the stairs when Fuller reached out with his left hand, grabbed an ashtray that had been situated next to the lamp and hurled it at her. She skidded to a halt to avoid it, but her stocking feet slipped on the highly polished stairs. Her legs flew off from beneath her and she tumbled down the stairs, the immobilizer springing from her grasp. She flipped herself over, pulled herself to her knees, and quickly looked around. Teddy and Locke continued their sparring by the fireplace. Blood ran from Locke's nose. Fuller was reaching out with his left hand to try to grasp a book on the table. Grimsby was twisting two wires together from his weapon, sweat running down his brow. Give up yet? She heard Teddy say. Damn it, man, you're in my house attacking me! Once Morris gets here, Beverly spied the immobilizer under the chair. She crawled towards it. A deep, foreboding fear filled her as a low hum made her teeth vibrate. She forced herself to turn back. Grimsby was pointing his device toward her. There was a crack, and Grimsby fell backwards. A lamp to her side shattered, scattering glass across the floor. Her hand involuntarily flew to her face for protection. The fear immediately disappeared. Forget her, Locke screamed. Get Roosevelt. She turned back to Grimsby, who was on his knees aiming his device at Teddy. The cone at the end of his gun began humming and glowing a deep red. The fear once again started to rise. She reached down for her weapon, but instead felt a sharp pain in something metal. Without even looking, she threw it at Grimsby. A small spray of blood spurt from her cut palm, a piece of broken glass lodged within. The spring from the clock sailed across the room and lodged itself into Grimsby's cone. Sparks flew in all directions. Grimsby yelped and dropped the gun, which rattled to the floor. The red glow faded away and the fear dissipated. He shook his hand in the air, glared at Beverly, and reached down to pick it up again. Beverly crouched down and felt under the chair to grab the immobilizer. Blood smeared the floor from her cut. Her fingertips touched the nozzle. Not today, nigra! Her hands flew to her stomach as Fuller kicked her repeatedly with his one free leg. He laughed at her pain and continued to spout racist insults. She pushed away from him, her blood-stained hand leading a plast before her. That's enough, Teddy said. 
There was a crunch of a heavy punch, and then Locke fell to the floor in front of her. His eyes blinked unsteadily. A hum grew. She closed her eyes and put her hands to her ears to defeat the feeling of dread. Teddy's voice cut through the hum. And as for you, Professor Grimsby, crack! Teddy's limp body fell on top of Locke's. Locke groaned. Beverly's eyes widened. She reached behind her, found her weapon, and pulled herself to her feet as the hum once again grew strong. Grimsby faced her, his electrical stunning gun glowing red with the cone. I'm very sorry, madam, but I promise this will not hurt, he said. Her own screams hid the crackling noise of Grimsby's gun as her body shook uncontrollably, but it only lasted a few seconds before everything went dark. So that's a chapter or so from Big Stick by Michael A. Ventrella. You can find out more by going to michaelaventrella.com. And if you want to read the first few chapters, they're on my webpage. Um, and the book is available through Eric Flint's Ring of Fire Press. Thank you for listening.